So uh, before I start, I'm just before I get into details of MicroPython and executing it, I'm going to tell a story. So in 2006, I fell in love. So over 10 years ago, with Python. And when you fall in love, you just want to spend all your time with your loved one. And we did. We did command line scripting, web applications, graphical applications, networking, coroutines. We spent all our time together. But then, on one fateful day, something horrible happened. Conky. So, who here knows what Conky is or ever used it or heard of it? Raise your hand if you have. Good, it makes it even more exciting. So, <laughs> Conky is kind of a silly piece of software, but very useful. And um, this is Conky, what it looks like. Um, what it lets you do is just monitor the resources on your computer. Um, it's a very like geeky thing to do, whatever, but um, you know, you can see uh, the CPU, RAM, disk usage, stuff like that. And this is my Conky setup that I have on my computer. So, um, so I could do all this stuff with Python, I was very happy with it. And then when I encountered uh, Conky, I went to configuring and customizing it. And it has these 300 built-in widgets for CPU, RAM, so all that stuff. But then you always have something custom, right? That's relating to your setup. And for me, I had these five things I wanted to watch for. Um, Debian packages, do I have any updates, my domain controller password, stuff like that. So the way Conkey works is if you want to extend it, and they have a simple hook in where you just, in your config file, put some scripts, um, and then you specify how often you want it to be called. So I was like, cool. So I created five scripts in Python, of course, the love of my life, and um, I wanted it to update every second. So I was like, okay, so Conkey is going to spawn these processes every second. And I have five of these scripts. So I just did a calculation. I was like, oh, crap. It's going to run this 400,000 times every day. So I thought, hey, maybe that's OK. Let's see what happens. So I did. And initially, I just made a very simple Python Hello World and kicked it off and said, OK, what's this going to do? And Conkey itself is implemented in a very efficient fashion because it would be really lame if your resource manager put a lot of load on your system. right? So when I did this, my CPU usage shot up to 15%. But then instead of Python scripts, when I just wrote Hello World in Bash, it used a lot less CPU. And so I ended up just not using Python for this and uh, slapping together some Bash scripts and not doing it every second, doing it every 10 seconds and whatnot. But you know, over time, over the years, I found stuff that Python hasn't worked out for me. And it's always frustrated me because I hate programming in Bash. I mean, if statements and for loops in Bash are, are very ugly and painful to work with. So it frustrates me if I can't use Python. Um, and these are two kind of other examples, separate to the Conkey example, um, where uh, there's issues sometimes, let's say, in performance. And maybe you want to measure that performance. Um, so one example is, you know, in your text editor, you can hook in uh, a lint checker whenever you save, and, and I use Vim, and whenever I save my source code, it goes and uh, runs Flake 8 on it. And uh, if you just check this on a very, like, simple file, like a single line, print hello world, uh, it takes over 300 milliseconds, right? Um, now, from a usability perspective, right, Anything beyond 100 milliseconds, people will perceive. And it's very frustrating when you're editing code, and then you save, and then you feel this kind of lag you know, as you're saving the file. But you know, it's very useful to have the pep eight checking, syntax checking, so I accept it. Um, and what I'm going to kind of present in this uh, talk is an alternative to CPython that has a much faster startup time, uh, which is using uh, MicroPython. But we'll see that uh, later. Another use case is bash completion. So, Whenever you're in command line doing tap, 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 you're typing and you really want a responsive uh, experience. You know, so anything that takes more than 100 milliseconds, you start thinking what's going on. And, uh, you know, when I first started working with PIP, I was like, oh, cool, they have bash completion for PIP, so I set it up. And when I did PIP, tap, 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 you know, sometimes it can take up to a second, you know, to, to kind of do the bash completion because PIP is a little heavy to import and execute. And this is very frustrating. So when I first started using it, I thought maybe there's something wrong with my terminal with SSH connection. Maybe the network's stuck or whatnot. Um, and 
so in the end, I, I just disabled it and stopped using it because when something gets so slow, then it, uh, in terms of usability, then it impacts the functionality of it. So uh, we're going to try and look at two things to measure in script execution. So we focused on, let's say you have a specific script, a program, and you're going to execute it. It's going to start and it's going to end. And you want these two simple things. You want to know what was that lapse time and uh, also the clock cycles. Now, why the clock cycles? And it's funny. I mean, like from an end user perspective, all they care about is the elapsed time. But when I started running these benchmarks on this laptop, which is five years old, and then my other desktop, which is a newer computer, on the desktop was a lot faster, right? And which is natural, you know, in CPUs. And that can be kind of frustrating when you're comparing results. But what's cool is if you compare the clock cycles, it'll be the same, right? Because if you have the same OS, the same uh, software, generally it's going to go through the same number of instructions uh, to execute. So clock cycles can be useful to, to kind of more fairly compare, and elapsed time is the real kind of experience of it. Uh, and then when you're looking at the, the case of Conkey, maybe you're planning to actually execute some sort of crazy job that every second is going to do some polling, you know. Um, and you want to kind of measure, you know, how heavy is this going to be on the CPU. Um, so clock cycles will tell you that. So why measure one when you can measure five? So what I said is since I'm doing these benchmarks, and I know already that, you know, Bash Hello World can be faster than, say, Python, um, what I did is I said let's throw into the mix uh, five interpreted languages. So we have Python, Bash, Perl, Lua, and Awk. All of these languages are interpreted, like Python, so, and they have variables and functions and, and for loops. And so I said, okay, this is a fair comparison, because it would be unfair to compare it to C or Go, you know, that is compiled. And so I created these five files, um, and essentially they're all the same implementation, adding one plus one. So all of them, if you execute them in their language, they should output two. Um, and then uh, we're going to run all this through the performance and then see how does Python compare, you know? Is it unfair, you know, to expect like a very fast performance time from an interpreted language, you know. Um, and the first one, uh, add.py, will be used for the Python 3.5 test as well as MicroPython. So the same script will run it through both uh, interpreters and see the difference in performance. So how do we measure execution time? The easiest way is to just say time. And this is available in Bash on, on Unix systems like Linux and Mac. And now, this time is actually built into Bash, and it's different than a time uh, a binary that you'll find, you know, uh, on on, the, on your computer. So it's just important to know that distinction because some of the command line options are different. When you look at the man page for a time, it's not going to be this time instead of time. But generally, it's a very easy way of just measuring. So if you say time, you put the command, and the only number you really care about is the first number that's real, um, under real. And this shows that you know when I just run a script that prints 1 plus 1, and Python it takes on this machine uh, 48 milliseconds. And now this is more like a thorough approach, you know, and uh, uh, this is a very powerful command, it's very useful. So um, this is a Linux performance tool that comes, you know, uh, on Linux machines and you can use your package manager to install it. And the perf command uh, has a bunch of subcommands, and this is stat, the stat subcommand. Uh, and I've just highlighted in red some things that, you know, are worth noting. One is the dash r10. So anytime you do benchmarking, you don't want to just take one sample, right? Because it's not really uh, going to be indicative. So what's nice about this in the same command, unlike time, you can say, hey, do 10 shots, um, ten, a sample of 10, and uh, give me the aggregated results. So here it's saying it's running for 10. Another thing to note is the context switches. So uh, if you're running a benchmark or you're trying to measure the performance of a piece of software and you're running a lot of other programs on that computer, it's going to give you inconsistent results because, you know, the CPU is switching, context switching between those other CPUs, other processes. So uh, when you get zero context switches, it means this is good. You know, you ran the, the benchmark on, on a machine that um, didn't have a lot of other stuff going on. Then now we can get the cycles number. So uh, when you just in Python say print one plus one, 
you know, it goes through 50 million instructions, uh, CPU cycles, which is uh, uh, surprising. I don't know. I, I don't know much about like computer architecture and CPUs, but that's that's uh, how much it goes through. Then the last thing um, is the elapsed time, and so you can see that uh, this took 17.8 milliseconds, and the the percentage sign, the plus or minus, is the variance. So you just want to keep an eye out on this because if it's you know plus or one uh, percentage points, that's fine. But like if you have like a hundred percent variance or two hundred percent variance, it means that you're getting a lot of inconsistency between those different samples, and then you should step back and be like, well, I shouldn't trust this number, right? Um, so uh, now I jump back to my love affair with Python. And uh, I bumped into this little beauty earlier this year, and I purchased this on January 15th, 10 years after first discovering Python. And it's a, a popular Internet of Things hardware, and I got it just to tinker with it. It's a microcontroller running at 80 megahertz. And amazingly, you know, it can run Python through this implementation called MicroPython, which runs on bare metal. So when I got it, I just got it to play with Internet of Things. But um, then I started playing around more with MicroPython, and I discovered that you can install it on servers, on desktops. It's not only for microcontrollers, right? So then I started to compare the performance of MicroPython against regular Python, and you'll see the results. But just a brief on, on MicroPython, it's, it's a lean implementation of Python 3. They had to um, be much more cutthroat uh, about the way they implemented because it's targeted for microcontrollers, which have limited CPU and RAM and the rest of it. And so what they've done is they've taken a selection of core libraries and implemented them. Um, and they have this naming convention of putting uh, U, the letter U, like micro, you know, uh, in front of them. So you have some of the ones that I highlight is USocket. It's just like the Python standard library socket, and that lets you open HTTP connections, so you can do um, uh, HTTP client, server, and TCP and UDP. UOS, that lets you spawn processes, retrieve uh, output, and JSON, regular expressions, time, and zip. So it's got a nice mix of quite... Um, useful uh, packages from taken from the core library. Um, so let's look at the numbers. So when we run those scripts and just add two numbers, one plus one, right? This is a single text file with a single line of code that's interpreted in a number of different languages. We see Python is like way out there. It's you know around 18, 15 times slower. Um, than all of these other interpreted language, Lua, Bash, Perl, and Oc, right? But what's really interesting is MicroPython beats them all, and you know, and it executes so fast, um, just adding these two numbers, right? And I was really surprised that you can do this in under a millisecond, because you know, once you get to that level, just the process of spawning a process, opening the text file, reading the contents, compiling it, right? Uh, and uh, it's amazing that it does it in under one millisecond. So um, I really encourage people to explore uh, MicroPython, you know, outside of microcontrollers, you know, even on their desktops and their servers. Um, it could be useful in a whole array of uh, stuff. So the same sort of, this is, I use that same tool, StatPerf, for both uh, set of graphs. And this is in terms of the CPU cycles. And so we see that you know Python needed 46 million uh, CPU cycles, but MicroPython only needed one. And um, so it's a much kind of more lean uh, implementation. And so now, you know, it's it's about like I guess 30 or so times less, which means that I could probably use this now for a conky, um, and I wouldn't get this high uh, CPU usage. So. Um, Cool, so the next part of the presentation is just looking at uh, a real life implementation of using MicroPython outside of the microcontroller um, to do something useful. So uh, what I've done is I've done a pip bash completion uh, using MicroPython. And what's cool about that is pip already has bash completion built in. So we can compare the two in terms of performance and in terms of feature set. And Besides speed, there's also stuff that you can do in MicroPython that would be frustrating to do in other languages that have better startup, uh, have equivalent startup times, like Bash, if you had to go and connect uh, to, to a web server and fetch a listing of the wheel packages, which is what we'll be doing here. You know, it'll be frustrating to do in Bash. So, um, cool. So let's 
see how the built-in PIP uh, performs. And if we just import PIP, because you know when you do the auto completion press tab, it imports it and then calls it. Just importing the package, like I haven't called the auto completion, you know, on 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 my laptop takes one second, and a lot of the machines I've I've seen it, it's it's heavy, and so you're really going to feel that, you know, when you when you press tab. You'd, the general, you know, benchmark is you want it to be under under 100 milliseconds usability. Generally, anything under 50 milliseconds, people can't perceive. You know, they can't perceive more than 24, 25 frames per second. So, um, but stuff more than 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, you're going to feel that kind of jittery lag. And uh, anything in the terminal typing will be like that. The other thing is the built-in uh, pip completion. It only completes the subcommands. So if you do pip, it says install, whatever, but it won't complete the names of packages or stuff like that. So we're going to take it to the next level, and, and we will also complete all of that. So now, uh, the code that I'm showing and everything, it's, it's more kind of like a demonstration. It's not uh, the perfect kind of implementation. Um, so for the demonstration, I have a local PyPy mirror uh, that I've created, and what I've done is I've just grabbed a whole bunch of wheels over 400 wheels and just have them served uh, uh, on a static web server on Nginx. And um, to do that, you just set these environmental variables um, so that pip looks in that location. Um, I'm doing it as localhost, but you can uh, uh, do it on any uh, uh, web server in your environment. Um, and so we'll autocomplete the subcommands in the implementation, and we'll also, every time you press tab, it will uh, connect over HTTP, check, you know, on Nginx, what's a set of wheels. So the moment a new wheel is published or put on the web server and you press tab, it will autocomplete, which is nice. Because some times there's a trick when autocompletion is slow, people cache the results, but it's frustrating because a lot of times you have to log out and back into the terminal. This will be live for each call. It will also complete not just the package name, uh, the versions as well. Um, so you'll get all of that information in the terminal when you do tab completion. So I won't go into too much detail about this, but you know, uh, there's different ways of doing batch completion. Um, usually, if you want it to run live each time, then you have a batch function um, and you use this complete in that fashion. Um, I've set the command option file names because when we say pip install, you know, click equals equals 1.0 equals is actually a special character in batch and it needs to be escaped. And you'll see that. So this is how you say, you know, allow special characters, file names. And then you'll see that all the work is being done by this pip comp uh, guy. And we'll look at his source code, and he receives one argument, uh, comp c word. And comp c word, if you're completing the first uh, argument, then it will say one. If you're completing the second argument, then it will say two. And we'll need to keep track of that because if you do pip space tab, then we want to say install, freeze, whatever. If you do pip install space and then tab, we want to give it the package names. Um, so yeah. So let's look at the code. So these are all the packages that we'll be using in this implementation. And at the top, that just says, hey, use the MicroPython interpreter instead of uh, Python. Uh, U requests is just like, very similar to requests that we all know and love. Um, except uh, it's implemented to work with use sockets and it's a more kind of lean implementation. And um, then uh, OS and, and sys. So this function does the bulk of the work and the first line will go and uh, connect um, uh, using requests to the URL provided, you know, uh, and fetch the HTML output. Uh, the second line will go parse all the HTML and get the list of wheel files that are hosted on the web server. Um, and uh, then we just loop through the wheels and, and parse by dash and uh, split, sorry, by dash to show the name and version. Um, the wheel file format's really cool because in the file name, uh, it's encoded the name and the version so you can get all that information easily. So, and then that's it. So that's the whole function. The lower bit is just the main and all he does is he checks if you gave argument one, then this is the list of subcommands that will complete. And if you gave argument two, then uh, we don't want to hard code the URL, so we'll get what the user has specified in his environmental variables by getting pip find links. We'll call get packages, and then we'll print out this new line delimited. So 
uh, to do batch completion, you just have to spit out, you know, a list uh, of values that are space delimited, new line delimited, whatnot. And uh, so let's compare the performance. So we know that just importing pip for auto completion can take up to 100, 1,000 milliseconds. So how does this fare? So we see that when he's just simply spitting out the commands, he does in 3.9 milliseconds, which is way under 100. And uh, when he connects to uh, the package names, um, uh, to fetch the package names, uh, he opens the HTTP connection, gets that, parts the HTML, and prints it out all in 11 milliseconds, uh, which is fantastic uh, performance, way more than uh, what we need. So let's do a live demo. Okay, so. So the first thing that I will do is just set up a clean environment. So uh, this is, uh, shouldn't have anything installed on it. And we can start pipping. So uh, let's just look at pipcom for a second. So if I say one, he should tell me the commands, which he does. If I say two, he should connect to my web server. And uh, we can see the Nginx web server here, and it just has these bunch of wheel files here, and he's just opening this URL and, and fetching and then uh, spitting out the package names equals the rest of it. Now, let's just check how many packages we have in the demo, 409 wheels, uh, and uh, let's start doing some auto-completion. So if we do pip inst uh, well, let's do pip tab. So this is working now, I can put the commands. I can say pip s, it gives me options, install. Now uh, I can just do tab, and it shows me 409 packages, so quite a few. I can go and say OK, show me all the packages beginning with C, and you'll see that it's showing uh, click and colorama, you know. And now, uh, so I can go and say, OK, I want to install click, let's say version 1.0, do tab. So you see the equal signs get escaped correctly. And let's install Colorama too. We can do pip freeze to see what's installed. And why not upgrade click to 6.0. And if we see it, pip freeze, we can see it's been upgraded to 6.0. So, um, so that's it. Uh, I'll just, uh, whoops, yes, um, that's the whole presentation, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for your talk. It's actually a really interesting approach uh, to use it for completions. But I'm wondering uh, to which degree this uh, MicroPython is compatible or incompatible to regular Python, and like, is there a like, realistic chance to port uh, larger existing programs from Python into MicroPython? Uh, thanks for the questions, very good question. So um, it is actually challenging, like if you just took a big code base, like uh, pip, for example, you know, uh, or flake, you know, and you try and start importing it. Uh, it's just a lot of stuff's not going to work. Um, but you know, what would be really great, and and Armin talked about this, you know, uh, in the keynote a few days ago, is, you know, let's say you have the specification of Python. It would be really nice if you could go and then have a formalized subset of Python called the MicroPython specification. And then people could come in and be like, hey, I'm going to write Flake 8 so that it supports both, you know, uh, the full-fledged Python and MicroPython. And that's happened in the past with Jython, for example. Um, you know, uh, Django for a long time supported Jython. And uh, when you'd run Django, it would make sure that this code would work equally well in Python as well as Jython, even though the Jython join time environment is so different. So um, I think right now at this stage, there will be issues, but um, I think there's just uh, a lot of opportunity and potential. Um, and MicroPython is just, it's really stable uh, and it's used. So I think 
there's a lot of potential and uh, for it and opportunity for it. But yeah. Thank you. That was pretty informative. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, that uh, in, uh, apparently uh, Linux uh, has a long tradition for solving uh, these problems like uh, with, you had with Kanki. Uh, it's like you just uh, spawn a long running process because uh, it generally boils down to uh, the startup tap, uh, yep. startup time uh, of Python interpreter because this is a little misleading that you say uh, all the way the performance of Python because mainly this is bootstrapping time. Yeah? If, you, if you put nothing instead of print, then you would approximately get uh, the same time because this is all about loading libraries, etc. Uh, but yeah, uh, like uh, in case of awesome uh, window manager, when you are writing scripts uh, that want to run fast, uh, then mainly uh, you just uh, spawn long running process and then uh, use just some, uh, some type of buffering. Like with Conky, you could just uh, dump uh, your data into file, then cutting in Conky, and then you, you would get uh, some kind of real time because that's what you want, yeah? Because 18 milliseconds, it's not uh, so much, really. Yeah, you know, what is 18 milliseconds, right? Like, when I first saw it, I thought it was nothing. But I think it's always good to look around at what's there. So, when you can see an implementation of a subset of Python, you know, running it 30 times more, maybe there's these opportunities that can arise from it. So. Think of the presentation more as an eye-opener to possibilities. Um, but what you said is very important, and it's true. I mean, one could argue that the architecture of Conkey is messy. You know, you're just going to spawn a process every time, right? Even if it's fast, you know, that can feel very kind of sloppy, right? Maybe uh, I should have a long-running process and then do some inter-process communication, right? Like Dbus or something like that. But one of the reasons why calling other processes and just getting the output is such a popular method of hook-in is because it's so easy to implement. And it's very widespread, right? Like Conkey uses it, Vim uses it, Emacs uses it. Like when Vim, I'm using Syntastic, you know, when I press save, each time it's calling Flake, right? Um, you know, even though maybe someone could have made a Flake server and then it could kind of call it more efficiently, right? Um, the same thing is true of a lot of uh, Jenkins, as an example, you know, like when it wants to hook into Python, a lot of times it's spawning these processes. So it's kind of uh, a very popular way of hooking in, uh, executing programs and just capturing their output. But, you know, uh, as you said, it's not necessarily a fair, you know, uh, assessment of Python. And I wouldn't put it as a criticism uh, of Python because I've never had, uh, at least in the systems I create or uh, production environments, this sort of uh, issue. If, if I have a startup issue, I create a long-running process and then do some inter-process communication, whatnot, like you said. But yeah, thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I don't know anything about MicroPython apart from what you just showed us. But I was wondering if there's any split between MicroPython 2 and 3, or it's only 2, or it's only 3, or... Yeah, good question. So, MicroPython isn't that old. So, when they created it, they said, we're not going to support Python 2. So, the whole thing is Python 3 from the start. And so, oh yeah, so it's, that's a, that was a very important thing, actually, because I, I just you don't want to go back at this stage, right? Um, so it's just all completely cleanly implemented in Python 3, and it's the same exact uh, syntax as Python 3. There's some differences, some edge cases, but you know you have all the same data structures, functions, classes, and the rest of it. The more I worked with it, um, the more I didn't encounter any surprises. Uh, in terms of that. But, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, quick question: Do you think you, may, uh, MicroPython uh, will have an effect, an impact on Python 3 itself, main C Python? Uh, sorry, say the last bit again and just cut off. Do you off. think MicroPython 
a good things in MicroPython will have an impact on the C Python implementation. Mm. Uh, well, I hope so because you know before like before January seventeenth. If someone came to me and said, hey, Python should start in one millisecond, I'd be like, buzz off. You know what I mean? Like, 18 milliseconds is great. It's such a powerful language, right? Like, in a way, you could argue Bash, you know, or, or, or some of these other languages, they're very limited, you know, in a way, they're not as powerful as Python. But I think now that MicroPython has been implemented, and there's such a growth in Internet of Things, and so much contribution in MicroPython and stability, I think... It's going to make us ask that question again, you know, that Armin again raised about like, you know, PyPy, does it have to follow the C Python thing? You know, maybe we can have this specification. Maybe we can have a Python specification and then a subset, you know, or like you said, maybe some of these tricks that MicroPython has, C Python could use. But I'm not sure about that because Keep in mind, MicroPython, there's drawbacks to it. There's no multi-threading, no multi-process. And that's how it was able to get away with this kind of oversimplified uh, look. But it's, it's, it's amazing that you can get that much functionality with that few CPU cycles. So I'm, I'm surprised at it. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, uh, regarding the, the problems with... Uh, the incompatibility with uh, the code. Uh, is this uh, in the syntax level or is uh, the lack of uh, the standard library? What kind of incompatibilities mm. uh, do you encounter? So, good question. Uh, for me, when I implemented this, uh, so uh, one good example is requests. Right? Requests is such a popular library, right? Um, that everyone's like, ah, oh, do I have to directly talk to Socket? Because they give you use socket, but they don't give you um, the Python 3 libraries that you have for the HTTP client, right? So imagine like writing low-level socket code to connect to an HTTP web server. It's a pain, right? Um, so, you know, the MicroPython guys made you requests, um, and they made you G JSON, uh, regular expressions, and the rest of it. So I think a lot of the popular libraries are there and popular functionality, but um, it's, it's not that necessarily that the Python code that you write, that the list is different, or the string is different, or the function is different, because if the code that you saw looks exactly like regular Python, uh, which it is. It's just, you know, if you take any of these packages and you try and import, I don't know, collections, you know, um, uh, or even RE, as a regular expression, you know, you don't have the full RE. And so, you know, uh, they've made URE, which uh, has a lot of the functionality, but it's limited. So you'd have to change a lot of your import paths and you'd have to be thoughtful of what you're doing. I think, I think if, you know, the code isn't so crazy and complicated, then, then it's definitely worth it. Because, like you saw the, the uh, pip autocompletion, it's not like, 10,000 lines of code, you know. Um, I, th I think it was just uh, 15 or 20 lines of code. So, you know, if you have this kind of small thing, if you're making something new, I think it's definitely worth trying out. But. All right. Thank you very much, Marvan, for this sure. talk and the Q&A. Thank you.